Hello everyone and welcome today I'm with Peter Todd. Peter, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. So we are here at uh, Kuba Plus and so it's a, a dev lightning initiation to train some young Salvadorian to learn about lightning. Uh, you've come here before, so thank you so much for helping on, uh, on education. Most people in the industry would know you, still there's a lot of people coming and every bull run we have more people joining, so maybe yeah. could you explain who you are uh, for people that may not know you from Twitter or whatever. Well. I'm Peter Todd, and uh, I've been involved full-time in Bitcoin-related stuff since like 2014. Uh, that was kind of when I quit the day job, so to speak. And, uh, you know, I've done a lot of work on a lot of different things. Uh, but, you know, professionally, like you can kind of say I'm a consultant. Mm -hmm. I tend to go work for projects who go call me in to do various things. And I've also worked on Bitcoin Core, plus I uh, founded Open Timestamps. When you do consulting, you just tell them it doesn't work? Or Depends. Often it doesn't work. I mean, it depends on the consulting too. Like, for example, a recent project I did, um, actually just before I came here, was helping a group uh, working for the Guatemala Election Authority mm -hmm. to go and timestamp voting uh, summary data. So, you know, every polling station takes all those paper ballots, records them on another sheet of paper, scans them in, and sends them up for the preliminary results database. And we timestamp that. For time stamping, for people that don't know, we use it on Bitcoin, right? Maybe you could explain on like well, what you did with Well, I mean, Bitcoin. in general, like, I always stress, timestamp proof mm -hmm. is evidence that something existed before a certain time. Yeah. I mean, mathematically speaking, it's a proof some piece of data existed for another piece of data. And of course, math alone can't tell you when a piece of data existed. But things like Bitcoin aren't math alone. You know, they use proof of work and incentives and so on. And fortunately, Bitcoin blocks have a date field in them. So if we can prove something existed before a certain Bitcoin block was created, we have pretty good evidence as to when that piece of data, um, how late it could have been created. Yeah, a bit like, uh, well, it's not exactly that, but one Satoshi put on the white paper uh, within the first Genesis block. Sometimes. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Like what Satoshi did is sort of the exact opposite of a timestamp. Yeah. Satoshi was proving that Bitcoin was created after a point in time because he wanted to prove that he hadn't gone and pre-mined a whole bunch of stuff. And actually, when did you discover Bitcoin? Oh, you can lie if you want, but I'm uh, just wondering, uh, what's, your, what's your usual story? Well, of course, I am Craig Wright, yeah, so no, of I mean, course I, I invented that. Bitcoin. But uh, <laughs> no, I, uh, I think I heard about the white paper like late 2009. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember the first time I read it, I mean, honestly, my thought was, shoot, I should have thought of that. <laughs> it just, you know, once you kind of read the paper, it just seemed like such an obvious thing. And of course, quite famously, I talked to like Adam Back and Hal Finney when I was in high school, trying to invent Bitcoin, and you know we all failed, but we, but all of us, it's just so tantalizing simple how Bitcoin was. We all think you know we could have figured it out. Of but course, no one does. And that's a question like, what did Satoshi thought that you couldn't? Were you too narrowed, or like did he just saw it outside of the box? Was it yeah. just different? I I suspect to invent Bitcoin, you were you would have been better off not following the academic discussion about Bitcoin because, I mean, the impression I got, you know, looking at the history of sort of pre-Bitcoin discussion was we all missed the point. We all kind of spiraled around, like we had some ideas, but like no one seemed to get the really key thing, which was that you can make a ledger difficult to change through proof of work. People kept on having the idea of like creating coins through proof of work, but that's just wrong. That's just, it looks at it totally from the wrong direction. Because it doesn't really matter how the coins are created. You know, economically, there's a few different ways to do Bitcoin. But the really important thing is that you tie the ledger to the proof of work. And even now, I find people get caught up on this. They think, oh, you know, coins are issued by miners, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, nah, that's just, that's just a little implementation detail. That's not the most important thing. So when you discovered Bitcoin, you knew it would work? Or you said it was broken? Oh, well, I mean, I, I immediately knew like it, it could work. It, was, it took me a while to then think of all the ways where it wasn't quite working perfectly. Um, of course, one good example is it took me a bit of thought to realize, hang on a second, yeah, this has a pretty major scalability problem and not in a way that's easy to fix. As I remember early on, I thought, well, I mean, all right, maybe you know, people will run nodes generously, et cetera, et cetera. And the more I thought about it, the less convinced I was. <laughs> And, of course, one of the things I kind of got well known for in Bitcoin was being involved in the early scaling debate in, you know, 2013 and 2014. Yeah, what do you feel about the Bitcoin world, by the way? 
like uh, you lived it. You really oh yeah, I was it. very, uh, very involved in that. And, you know, I'm just very glad that it went the way it did and we won. Um, and frankly, I was actually expecting to get much more competent at adversaries. You know, I was expecting to be up against people who are technically competent and just didn't want Bitcoin to work, you know, the way all of us wanted. Instead, we were up against people who are technically incompetent and couldn't even like release forks of Bitcoin that worked properly. So it was, it was much easier than I expected in some ways. And even though you wouldn't do it again, I'm pretty sure, would you focus? No, oh, I mean, uh, well, you gotta understand, the reason why I got into Bitcoin was in large part because I realized because of scaling, because of other issues, Bitcoin would be political. And I like politics, it's fun. You know, I, I actually, like, and also this is also one of the reasons why I got into Bitcoin under my real name. Yeah, that's true. It's, um... Yeah, you can't, you know, you can, but it's much harder to be part of politics and part of a you know, worldwide discussion about a system if you're operating under a pseudonym. You can't do interviews in person with your face uncovered. Yeah, thank you for taking uh, that pass because a lot of uh, dev have not. And then it's always like, should I come and talk about what I feel? Yeah. Or should I just shut up? And your voice doesn't have the same meaning uh, when you yeah. come in person to conference. Yeah. Um, you did all the conference during the, I mean, all the big debates during the Bitcoin war. So it was like a Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, it, it might be hard to find a conference I didn't go to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, 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 for a very long time, the longest I had spent in my you know, home continuously was maybe a month and a half. I actually see you like, at every conference. Yeah, so it, like, like it, it really took until COVID when international travel shut down. That was finally when that stopped. And even then, I remember, you know, in like, was it be February 20... Yeah, it was 2020. Yeah, February 2020. I deliberately went to one last conference saying, all right, I might not get a chance to do this for a while. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, so right now, as of today, so you help on a lot of Bitcoin projects. You go to most of the conference to yeah. uh, talk, tell people yeah. Bitcoin is broken. Yeah. Try to yell on lightning too. Yeah. And then you help yeah. the government. You know, a lot of people like to have me go speak to them, be it in interviews, be it on the conference stage, be it you know, in private consulting. Like, I seem to be pretty good at that. I mean, frankly, I don't do that much direct work. You know, the last time I made an actual yeah, merged pull request to Bitcoin mm -hmm. Core was years ago. Yeah. I happen to have one open right now, and I need to do some stuff on it. But, you know, I, I, I seem to be much more in demand for talking about stuff than necessarily implementing it directly. But is it because you don't want to push your idea into Bitcoin anymore? Or is it more because you feel like other people are doing it? Well, for no. Bitcoin Core specifically, yeah. and of course you gotta remember, like Bitcoin, Bitcoin Core, these are all separate things. Um, for Bitcoin Core specifically, the things that I've wanted to see change that were within my capabilities of doing, for the most part, they've all been implemented. Um, you know, I could, I could think of some other stuff I'd like to do, but, you know, I'm not a very good C++ programmer. I don't like working in C++. So, to, to be perfectly honest, like, I'm kind of disincentivized from working on Bitcoin Core directly. Yeah, I'm quite happy to go and, like, write, you know, blog posts and mailing list posts about aspects of it and maybe push other people to do something. But I personally don't, you know, it's not my interest to write hundreds of lines of code on Bitcoin Core. Yeah, okay. So what would be the thing you want to be pushing now that you see is the most important, like privacy, lightning? Like well, I mean, things? you gotta like you gotta remember the, the the law of comparative advantage always applies. There's a lot of very smart people working on lightning right now, and for me to go work on lightning protocol directly, well, you know, maybe I'm maybe there isn't that much I can contribute necessarily, as as well as maybe I could take my skills and apply it to something else. Yeah. Um, one thing that I think has been underappreciated has been things like timestamping. Yeah, and of absolutely. course, yeah, well, I'm founder of Open Timestamps. Yeah. And the reason why I founded Open Timestamps was, well, first of all, you know, back in 2012, I had the idea. And I thought, oh, this would be cool. I made up a little prototype and it was running for a while, but I didn't really push it further. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, surely someone's going to make this for real, for mm -hmm. in production. And no one did. So finally, in like 2016, I just got frustrated by the fact it didn't really exist. You know, my prototype wasn't very good. So I sat down for a weekend and banged out a redesign to make it better. And that became the production release that turned into open timestamp so it is now. And, you know, as an example, as of was it like a week, yeah, but a week ago, the recent Guatemalan election used timestamps to timestamp every single ballot, um, ballot total that came in. 
well, sure enough, there's been allegations of fraud. Yeah, I know. I and, you're, you're yeah, today. yeah. So I don't know. Maybe time stamping did a little, did a little bit of good there. I mean, obviously, you know, something the size of an election, it, it won't come down to one factor. But to have time stamps on all this data and be able to say, okay, most of those don't look fishy, is very important because it means they don't have to redo the entire election. And uh, so talking about time stamp, what did you think your, your thought on the RGB? Because I, I know you've been... R RGB. Yeah, RGB. Because yeah. I know you're, you're friends with Giacomo. Giacomo yeah. was talking about the RGB. It's really involved. It's mm -hmm. a sub-project of Bitcoin. Yeah. So I'm just curious about your thought on Well, that. I think RGB is another one of these examples of something which is a little underappreciated. Um, the technique it uses, which is client-side validation yeah. with single use seals, is something... I pioneered, as far as I can tell. I yeah, mean, that, that's obviously. What I'm asking, yeah, I mean, obviously. Well, baby, and, and, I'll point, and, and I should stress with all this stuff, I'm sure you could find people writing papers on this well before me. But you know, crypto is a funny thing where people keep reinventing stuff over and over again, and somehow my iteration of it and my terminology for it seems to have stuck. And like open timestamp is one of those things where kept on not existing and I did some more work on it. Unlike Open Timestamps, a different group finally yeah, sat down and actually made it happen, yeah. And I will say, like, RGB as a programming challenge is quite hard. Open Timestamps is much easier because the difference is to prove something existed in the past, you kind of just take the whole thing and just hash it and do some other math and integrate it into a Bitcoin block, mm -hmm. basically. I'm simplifying a bit, but that's basically true. So you can kind of take the thing from the bottom up and apply a timestamp to it. But RGB, what it does that timestamping can't do is RGB proves that something is unique, and that is much harder. Of course, timestamping existed before Bitcoin. Bitcoin proves something is unique. Bitcoin proves coins are unique. RGB does the same thing, but for arbitrary assets and leverages Bitcoin to do this. But to prove something is unique, the thing itself is to integrate your protocol at like the deepest layers. And that is a much harder challenge. And it's why RGB, the team behind it's been working on it for years and only finally got a prototype out that actually works. I mean, they might say it's production, but I'm yeah. sure it will change a little more too, but. Are you running RGB? I know my team is, so I'm wondering. I mean, I'm not writing a, a node per se yeah. or anything like that. I do actually have an RGB wallet on my phone. It was very cool seeing this actually work After in so reality. Many, yeah, yeah. About yeah. It, so. and, I mean, I'll probably still work on some of those ideas. Um, as an example, with my Open Timestamps project, mm -hmm. um, I still need to do some work on doing better like data synchronization. Because as part of timestamping, you end up with all this so-called calendar data. Well, if I have a copy of that data you know, on my calendar servers, you probably want to copy too. And there just isn't great mechanisms to copy it from one place to another and for you to be sure you have the full thing. You know, we have a script that does backups, but it doesn't provide you a guarantee that you actually have the right thing, like Git does, as an example. Yeah. So this is stuff we want to go fix. And the sort of techniques to do this are the kind of things that RGB uses under the hood. And some of it, like, from a cryptographic point of view, it's very simple. It's just applying hashing. But from a software development point of view, you really got to have good software to deal with this stuff. And as an example, if I want to work with, say, a vector, you know, a list um, in software. Mm -hmm. Lots of programming languages have lists. Pretty much all of them, really, other than a few exceptions like C, which, you know, C is dodgy. Yeah, like C. But Rust certainly has it. But if I want a Merkle tree, and I want to just say, hey, I want a Merkle tree, and I want to put this in it, there's a much harder challenge, because there's very few libraries that do this well. Arguably, basically none. Um, you know, you can have a library that will maybe make a Merkle tree for you, but it certainly won't let you like write it to disk and then get back part of it and then do a modification of it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All that software doesn't really exist very well. And it's one of the challenges for writing something like RGB. And I would like to do better on this. I have kind of working on and off a project called Proof Marshal, and it's very challenging and it's mostly off, if you will. <laughs> and, you know, you can't really use it yet, but that's on my sort of longer term to-do list. Yeah, what I really like about RGB is just like it's not recreating the wheel. It's like using the fact that the UTXO can only be unique and spend exactly. once yep. to actually prove yep. the ownership of the contract. Yep. And then the contract is yep. not even stored on the blockchain because it's side client validating. So yep. you have to maintain your state of the contract so it can scale anonymously. So you really get yep. a, a privacy level yep. on RGB 
and yeah. we can argue it's a day or two, yeah. three or two, whatever. But it, it's really I mean, R it's RGB hard. hasn't implemented this, but for instance, if you go to my blog, um, PeterTry.org, yeah. and like scroll down, what, five posts or something, I have a write up from a few years back on how you could use these client side validation techniques to have trustless with respect to validity token trading at like literally billions of transactions per second. There really is no limit because you can apply a Merkle tree to it. And once you can apply a Merkle tree to something, it tends to have, you know, O log, o log, to, uh, yeah, o, o log 2 and scaling, which is great. I mean, it's the same kind of scalability that Open Timestamps has. But if you do it right with client side validation, you can do that for token transfer. Now, this isn't the same thing as Bitcoin. It's also not the same thing as Lightning. There are different trade-offs, um, one of them being that aggregating all this means that you're trusted with respect to censorship because you have to work with someone else, which could potentially be you, of course, to aggregate all this data and then commit it on Bitcoin. But the aggregating process can't lie because it is a mathematical proof. And of course, if you're worried about censorship, you can always use, say, two out of three at once or something like that. There's lots of very simple techniques get past this. And of course, applying this, all these techniques with zero knowledge proofs, assuming this math holds up and you know, that develops in a secure way will be very interesting because you could get things where you know, I could prove to you that this like 10 gigabyte long history of token transfers was in completely valid. Well, it, not giving you the proof, yeah. Yeah, it may happen. I mean, people say it works, people have you know, zero knowledge proofs that claim to work, but it will take a while for the math community, the cryptographic community, is really sure these techniques actually work the way they think they are. Yeah, we, we actually were talking about that earlier today, that you, I was asking you what would be the next frontier for cryptography and yeah. what needed to be reinvented or what worked, what could yeah. be improved. You were telling me like signature didn't need it more work, but zero knowledge proof was the way forward for studies, research, and maybe yeah. our, our students that do yeah. want to go deeper. Well, like, the big thing is, you know, a signature when you boil it down to what it does, you have a public key, you have a private key, you know, you have a proof that you know you owned a private key and you committed some message, etc. Our signature algorithms are very good. If that is what you need, they're pretty good. Obviously, someone maybe will come up with one that's faster, mm -hmm. but for so many use cases, the speed of the signatures, you know, how much CPU time they use and how big they are, really, it's mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's pretty good. You know, we can make a signature with elliptic curves that's 64 bytes. I don't know, maybe some incredibly clever guy will get that down to 32 somehow, but that's, that's yeah, it's only a 50% improvement. You know, you can't get much better than that. Like, they're certainly not gonna get down to one, because one byte is obviously too small. But with zero knowledge proofs, you could take something that's gigabytes of data, potentially, and drill it all the way down to, I don't know, maybe in the future, 32 bytes, right? Probably more, but hypothetically, maybe that will, maybe it'll be that good one day. Uh, quite interesting. So, um, you were talking about uh, RGB, where and you were talking about asset creation and liquidity. And it's just a weird question that came because I never asked you what was your stakes on Namecoin and all the shitcoin that came out <laughs> two or three years ago. We never talk about that because we're, yeah. we're all maximalists, so we don't. Yeah, we don't really care. Like, we yeah. don't talk about it. Yeah. I'm actually curious because you saw it from well, the well, you you, you mentioned Namecoin, which yeah. I think is an interesting example because. I, could, I can actually criticize that, I, that coin without even mentioning the coin part. Yeah. I mean, frankly, you know, decentralized key value namespaces turn out to be much less popular than people want them to be. And I think the reason ultimately comes down to having centralized authority in control of these things turns out to be really useful yeah. because if Microsoft.com loses their domain name, for the most part, the rest of us would much rather they get back. And the only way you can possibly do that in a decentralized system is by putting someone in charge to make the human decision as, okay guys, you screwed up, you lost your private keys, you're idiots, but here's it back. But then you lose all the security element that uh, we, we wish. Yeah. I will say, even if that was a good idea, attaching a name to it's kind of, you know, attaching a coin to it is just so silly. That's true. And uh, we're not over with shitcoins, next bull run. They will come back, but it doesn't really... Uh, they always come back. come back. They always. Yeah. Will they stop at some point? No. No. Nah, there will always be... There will always be demand by people who are scammers to try to defraud people of their money. 
This is why, like every single type of scam in history, for the most part, they're all still going on. Yeah. You know, they might be going on less of them, but all these types of scams are still going on. I mean, you know, the whole three cups scam, that was probably invented, what, 10,000 years ago or something? And people still pull it off. Yeah, it's not going to stop. And even if we think about like the official scam that we're allowed to have, like central bank and other things, uh, it's not uh, going to stop. So speaking of the future, but not of shit coins, what are you the most excited for the next uh, couple of years on Bitcoin? We got stumps. I know you're probably not a big fan of it. We got ordinals. I know your point of view already. You talk about. I mean, I, I, I well with, with ordinals. I, I should. Oh. Ordinals themselves is just a silly way of putting a number to a Satoshi. Mm -hmm. Inscriptions, I mean, I've written tools to go publish data in Bitcoin blockchain. I mean, I did that with my, uh, as, as a, an example for my Python Bitcoin lib mm -hmm. library um, years ago. So I'm not so much against it, but I think like you just have to be realistic that people will go do it. It's a useful thing to have, being able to publish things. And trying to go and stop it, I mean, it's not really going to work out. Now, is the inscriptions market as it is? Is that a good idea? Well, you just got to look at them. They, they obviously don't have staying power. And what do you know? Bitcoin fees are going down again. Yep. So obviously, they had a bunch of interest, and that money kind of ran out. Yeah, it was but, really funny how people said, uh, oh, you don't realize how much those DeFi guys have money to spend. I'm like, no, they don't. Well, that's great. They have money, <laughs> and we can go use it all up. I mean, they're spending millions. I mean, at the peak, I think they were spending millions a day. Yeah. Collectively, and they didn't change anything. Yeah, yeah, it just yeah, it spiked fees up for a bit. I mean, my open time stamps calendars as an example. Yeah, I had to go do a few tweaks to keep them running, mainly because, like, frankly, the code I have on them is kind of kludgy. But I mean, tweak that stuff, it was fine. You know, things slowed down a bit, and now that fees are going up, I can do timestamps cheaper. No big deal. That's true. The thing that it did revive is the whole debate about which BIP we should pass and do we need that covenant, which solution should we make? Well, Bitcoin although it, it only revived that for really dumb reasons because people blamed on Taproot, yeah. which is just wrong. I mean, you could do, in fact, especially towards the latter part of the inscriptions, the, lad, the biggest spike of inscriptions were actually things that were not uploading you know, data to the chain. They're uploading metadata about made up assets. And those inscriptions were very small. Like the, what they were actually putting in the chain, technically speaking, didn't actually even need a Bitcoin transaction that was unique. Mm -hmm. They could have done this with Bitcoin transactions identical to any other one by simply moving a little bit of data off chain, you know, like the RGB approach. Yeah. And under that circumstance, had they done that, you wouldn't even know necessarily why fees were going up because it would be a huge demand for perfectly normal looking transactions. Which would have been a really funny, uh, like on Twitter, people would have guessed uh, every, all and everything. Right? Yeah. yeah so, and so, um, covenants, what do you think of it? Because then the question is like, well, you, no, the well question, what type of covenants are we talking about? Okay, like, right? should, I'm going to get even higher. Do you want Bitcoin more malleable? Man, like, do you want more functionality like covenants? Only if there's like a very good reason. So, with the check template verify, um, proposal yeah. um, put out by Jeremy Rubin. Uh, yeah, right? yeah, well, the, 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 no, not no, 300, I think it's something else. Okay. But, but, the, but you know, specifically the recent one, um, when he tried to do a quick soft fork, yeah. my comment on it was basically, look, you have written up this BIP and you just haven't made your case because your examples are all kind of hand wavy. You've never actually written running code that implements this stuff fully. You know, you have some examples that are obviously weak arguments. And yeah, hypothetically, maybe someone can make a good argument for this stuff. But they have to make that argument, and it has to actually be worth it. Bitcoin is, you know, like a half trillion dollar asset. You need to have a pretty good reason to change that. And it may be the case that what covenants offer, I mean, especially with things like vaults, yeah. just isn't interesting enough. And vaults especially I'll criticize because vaults, the name isn't even right. Like a vault is not a vault, it's a tripwire. Yeah. The purpose of a vault is not to make your coins safer, it's to warn you if someone's trying to take them. And if you don't heed that warning, they'll just take them just fine. That's what a vault really is. It's a warning, hey, you should go into, you know, you should do something about this. And it's the type of warning which we've always been able to implement in other ways. 
maybe not as clean as maybe a new upcoat, but the fact no one's even trying to make wallets that use these existing ways, to me smells like what we really have is people who want to make a change to Bitcoin, don't actually want to make a product that hard, and are focusing on, oh, well, we can do this cool change, rather than let's do the really hard, annoying work of actually making a product. Yeah, that makes me think of uh, Liana from uh, Wizard Studying and uh, Miniscript that they use to do like a uh, time yeah. lock within yeah. the wallet, yeah. and then you can really like yeah. increase on your uh, yeah. security level in a smart yeah. way without like trying to push it, you know. And notice how that team is not the one writing, say, the op vault BIP or the op CTV BIP. Yeah, they're the one right? building actually the thing. Yeah. And I mean, if that team proposes uh, a vault opcode, or hopefully they call it tripwire at that point, or you know, CTV opcode, fine, they'll probably pay more attention to them. But as long as people who are not actually building things are proposing these concepts that just don't seem that important, they just have a much higher bar to get over there. I'm not ruling it out. And frankly, you could say I'm kind of guilty of this too. I mean, after all, I created opcheckon to verify. And when I created that opcode, you know, I had some examples. But did I go write, say, a full implementation of things using those? No, I went and wrote out things in Python, just demo how this could work. But remember, when I did OpCTV... I was going to say, yeah. it was a different uh, epoch. It was, uh, like it was so well, much has, uh, Bitcoin was worth a lot yeah. less money. Exactly. I mean, I think at and the less time... less people working on it, yeah. less moving pieces. Yeah, I think at the time, the market cap was probably on the order of, what, $100 million, a billion dollars? That's far less than what it is right now. And the amount of t dedication you should put into it has to go up. Every time we do a soft fork, there is a chance we screw something up. And just having Bitcoin mining come to a halt for a while is enormously expensive. Every single block that doesn't get mined properly represents like, why is it now? Like quarter of a million dollars worth of revenue, half a million dollars worth of revenue. And the reputation of what we yeah. take uh, yeah. be like damaging to a yeah. level. Uh, do not screw up. <laughs> and, you know, people may not like this because, all right, maybe it means Bitcoin development slows down. But, like, but yeah. there's so many other things you build on top. I mean, look at Lightning. There's so many interesting ideas in Lightning, and very few of them need changes to Bitcoin's core consensus protocol. Yeah, I was going to say, like, uh, do you think we'll get, like, another hard fork or soft fork on Bitcoin? And well, we'll what? definitely get a yeah, hard fork. Yeah, I know. We need one because of... Yeah, the 2106. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bitcoin will literally stop <laughs> yeah. in 2106. We have to fix this. Actually, like, <laughs> I thought, not like I can ask a question to someone, like, so much expert. Yeah. So expert, like, how do we fix that? Is it, like, really that easy? Why don't we fix it now? Why do we wait for the protocol to be even more complex to fix it? Well... Uh, so, so, I mean, maybe for the viewers, so the yeah, 2106 yeah, sure problem is that Bitcoin blocks contain a time. Yeah. And that time is roughly when the block was created. I mean, it's supposed to be exactly, but miners, there's no way to enforce that. So that time is 32 um, bits. And unfortunately, 2 to the power of 32 is only 4 billion. And it represents seconds since you know, 1970. And that literally runs out in the year 2106. And there just will no be, there will be no way to express a Bitcoin block after that point with current rules. Now, something we can do is we could reinterpret that as to say, well, if the block height is over this, we treat it as though it just wrapped around, right? right? And then reuse that same space. So maybe you know we treat it as like a 64-bit timestamp, and then we add some fixed offset. And hopefully, if we go to that trouble, we'll fix this forever, you know, forever. Because frankly, two to the sixty-four is no. so many years into the future. I'm not worried about it. <laughs> so everyone is going to accept because it's well, obviously it broke if we don't. But it's, well, uh, let's it's no let's risk. hope someone comes up with a simple way to fix it that's logical. Everyone occur, can agree it's the right way, and mm -hmm. people fix it like ten years before it happens. Because you know, remember, ten un years before you don't want to push it now or within your life. Ah, uh, it's it, it's a ways off. I mean, we can. We can wait, but unlike most, like unlike a lot of hard fork changes, though, you got to remember this is in the block headers themselves, mm -hmm. which means that things that do SPV style validation, um, they also have to go fix this too. Yeah. So this is actually a more invasive change than many other things in Bitcoin. Um, of course, SPV wallets, it's not necessarily as popular an idea as it used to be because the idea is kind of broken for the way it was originally, you know, advertised. But it still can be a useful thing. I mean, my open timestamps clients, as an example, there are cases where 
SPV style validation would actually add, add a lot of value. And they'll have to be fixed too for this. But you know, we got, what is it, you know, 70 years or something? Yeah, we, right. should, we should be fine. All right, so no worries, yeah. no worries. Yeah. Uh, speaking of bugs, you saw all the bugs out of, that Beacon had uh, over the, the beginning of, the, of its history, right? Did you ever Many of them. Yeah. I mean, keep in mind, I wasn't, I wasn't like actively, actively following Bitcoin until maybe like 2011, 2012. Okay, so they had yeah. to fix the bug limit yeah. by then. Well, it, you know, when I, when I learned about Bitcoin, I was at a geophysics um, startup, okay. simultaneously trying to finish an arts degree, then you know, also then start a physics degree, depending on what you, what, exactly what year it is. So I was very, very busy. <laughs> I, uh, I did not pay as much attention to Bitcoin as maybe I should have, yeah. but eventually I you, paid more attention. You, you, you got it now. Yeah. Um, all right, so, and um, speaking of uh, oscillation, a lot of people are afraid that Bitcoin will never move again. Are, do you think that a possibility or? I mean, if it doesn't, it's pretty good already. I'm, okay. not, I'm not that worried. I mean, when was the last time TCP IP changed? A long time ago, and even like for, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, like the biggest, the biggest change in TCP IP, I mean, you know, the, the internet is IPv6. Yeah, no, and that, yeah, when well, that transaction that started in 1996. Started. It, although, hey, you know, uh, but keep in mind, happen. IPv6, like if you actually look at the graphs of usage, so Google has one, if you just do um, Google, if search for like Google IPv6 adoption, they'll come up with a nice graph. Um, no one it, uses it. No, not at all. You're completely wrong. In fact, in, I believe it's the, in the US this year, it just passed over 50% adoption yeah. for traffic to Google. It's actually very widely used, but you know, we're talking about a change from like 1996 originally. And obviously there's a lot of, you know, the internet protocols are in many ways much more complex than Bitcoin. There's a lot more moving parts that have happened, but I think the bigger point is for the most part, things stay pretty stable and you go and do innovation on layers. So would we, could we make a parallel, for example, with Taproot that takes so much time to be implemented by all the, the companies and um, stuff like that? Well, Taproot will gradually get adopted when it makes sense. When it makes for, sense? Yeah, when for, it's for, economically viable, like, makes sense. Well, I mean, for certain things, Taproot is definitely economically viable. I mean, Lightning, it uh, makes a lot of sense for Lightning channels to use it because it means that you just pay less fees under certain types of scripts and you get better privacy. And gradually people will write the and code and too. deploy it. Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of reasons to do it, but with all this stuff, if you have a wallet that's being ridden by, you know, $150,000 a year engineers, well, how many transactions do you need to do to pay for $150,000 engineer spending a year working on a new feature? It's a lot, yeah. and a lot of wallets just don't actually have that much usage. So it'll take time for this to be worth it. Do you think we should uh, pay for our wallet, like hot wallet, let's say? It's about what I ideally, you would. I, I mean, yeah. all this stuff, ideally, there's a funding model that makes sense. I mean, personally, whenever I can pay for an internet service, I do. This is why I go pay for, you know, my Google account to the extent I can. I go pay their YouTube premium. I go pay for, you know, Google Photos. I mean, I go pay for Twitter, even though strictly I don't really need to. Because, I mean, it's the right thing to do. And I don't want, I want services that I'm paying for. I don't want services that are being given to me for free through some screwy surveillance economics. Yeah. So speaking of privacy, what is the stage, in your opinion, of Bitcoin privacy as of right now? Yeah, it's getting a lot better, um, especially like the adoption of Lightning automatically improves Bitcoin privacy um, for most threat models. And what I mean by that is, remember that if you, work, if you do transactions on chain, everyone in the world, no matter who they are, can go track those transactions. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean they can track it as well as they might want to, but they do get the raw data. In a lot of cases, that means they can get info on you. Now, you can use things like CoinJoin to avoid that, but even CoinJoin has its limits. Whereas Lightning, when I go do a Lightning transaction to you, fundamentally, the only people who can see that data are the people in the path. Mm -hmm. Now, in some cases, this may be much more worse privacy. I mean, say your worry is that Wallet of Satoshi is being tapped by the US government or something and that they're getting the data right from the source. Right? That could be much worse privacy. But against most attackers, it'll automatically be better just because you're not telling the entire world about the transaction. So 
we're, we're just lucky that's just an inherent part of Lightning. In fact, I'll, I'll further say, privacy is an inherent part of scalability. Because the reason why we have bad privacy on the base layer of Bitcoin is because we have bad scalability. Because we give the whole world the data. Yeah, but it's the only way to prove that there's an absence of uh, falsification. Like, because we can prove everything, we know no one is cheating. And well, then that's how Bitcoin works. Well, I mean, yeah, Bitcoin for technical reasons has to have that property. Now, of course, obviously, you could do things like, say, what Zcash does, what Monero does. Yeah. But from a technical risk point of view, you dramatically increase the chance that the currency fails. Um, Zcash is an example. They had the inflation bug. Yeah. Had that been exploited, absolutely, Zcash could have been completely killed. Just no doubt about it. Yeah, same for Monero. You know? yep. point. Same with Monero. Bitcoin, by having a transparent ledger, reduces the technical risk greatly. You know, maybe in 20 years, crypto will advance to the point where we feel comfortable to add that privacy tech to Bitcoin itself. But right now, I would definitely say no. Whereas doing the stuff on Lightning, the failure modes are much more benign. Worst case is some guy, or maybe you know, all users of some particular wallet, they lose their money. Remind me again, has that happened in Bitcoin's case before? Oh yeah, Mt. Gox. <laughs> yeah, and so, the, 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 so the privacy, I do agree, is kind of divided between on-chain and Lightning. Most people yeah. will use Lightning anyway. and They, they have we, to. By yeah. definition, they just have to. Yeah, exactly. And we hope that yeah. privacy by default yeah. will be but, but, better, but, but At this point, for me personally, it's probably something like 99% of transactions I do are on Lightning. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Because right. after all, I do lots of little transactions. Yeah, there's just no possible way. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, also things like Nostra tips. I mean, there's just no way I could do all that on chain. Yeah. I'd be spending so much money per month on <laughs> fees, it's absurd. And so what, uh, if you, you want to answer, what implementation of Lightning are you using, actually? Uh, uh, well, so for the nodes I run, I yeah. uh, just use LND. Okay. Um, for wallets, I basically have every wallet under the sun because out of professional interest, of yeah, course, no. you know, I have reasons to go try all this stuff. But certainly for most of the money I spend on Lightning, it's like my own L&D nodes and then I like uh, Blix wallet on Blixed Android. Wallet. Yeah, yeah. Really and with Blix, I just, of course, this is not how a lot of people would use Blix, but I, I just open channels to my own nodes. So yeah. I'm sending on my phone to, yeah, my, ch know, to my node and then onwards. Channel. But uh, any wallet you would recommend for like lower level, like lower technical people that wouldn't have. Oh, Phoenix, Phoenix is yeah. always my recommendation. Good. We also it's have Phoenix, Phoenix. Yeah, Phoenix um, Breeze has similar kind of advantage where you just put money in it, opens channels, and it just works. Um, Blixt, I believe it can actually do that too. Although I've never yeah, bothered to try because like every device I have Blixt on, it's I do it you know opening to my own. So I've never actually tried it properly with the way it's meant to be used. I really should just get another phone and actually install it and try it. But, you know, there's only so much time in the day to play with this stuff. That's true. So Lightning is not broken anymore? No, not so broken. Right. I mean, it's not perfect, but, you, you know, you do have problems with liquidity and routing still, but a it's lot less better. than it it's used to be. Better. Yeah, yeah, much, much better. I mean, I remember, you know, if it was like, what, four years ago, yeah. you'd feel pretty impressed if, Let's say a $50 yeah. transaction went through. I mean, just today, oh, I did a $1,500 transaction. Yeah, and uh, even for beginners, so I'm not on the technical part, I'm, I'm just like passionate about Bitcoin, but I'm not a, a developer, let's say. And so I bought the, one of the first 100 uh, Casa Lightning node that, yeah. that they released at the time. And it was a mess, honestly, on the yeah. uh, auto-connect, <laughs> it just didn't work. It was, yeah. uh, it was closing, forced yeah. closing, the channel was not passing through. So hard, and now like people can just get an umbrella node, it's up and yeah. running, it's easy, they connect, they use it. The I mean, at least people easy. tell me that it's easy. I, 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 I've never actually tried any of that stuff. Like it's, me, it's me, yeah, me personally, I just have, you know, Linux boxes, and you, you'll laugh, but like usually when I run things like Lightning nodes, I just SSH into them and manually start them. <laughs> and if the node somehow reboots, well, like fix it later. But I, I, you know, I should actually bother to figure out how to get this stuff started at boot, but I, I never really bother because these days, like virtual private servers, they're very reliable, you know, and even, you know, at home, I mean, I have a lightning node sitting on a little computer, yeah. you know, I have it on a UPS and it basically always works. Yeah. Are you afraid of the centralization of lightning? Like I mean, it's not ideal, but it's much better than the alternative. We're far better having lightning somewhat centralized and having... Bitcoin nodes themselves centralized. You know, like look at the extreme example BSV, where even as a centralized system, it's failing. 
because people can't keep nodes up. There's probably like a, literally a half dozen BSV nodes in the entire world. Yeah. Also, then I want they can just coordinate the 10 nodes to, to start yeah, again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it's, you know, unfortunately the block size war, there was really only one way it could go and that was to... We got lucky. Oh well, yeah, we, you so got to keep the block size small. I guess. Yeah. And, it, you know, and it bothers me too because you see things like Monero um, go into, you know, shit talk, if you will, Bitcoin, saying, well, your transaction fees are so high. Remind me again, what's your market cap? Oh yeah, like number 50. I mean, it's very easy to have low transaction fees, but hardly anyone uses your coin. Inevitably, when you get more demand, you will have to face these scaling issues. And coins like Monero that choose to have dynamic block sizes are very dangerous because having a clever technique to make the block size bigger doesn't change the fact that the system doesn't scale. Do you think Bitcoin, like I'm pretty sure the answer is yes, because I've seen internet grow my whole life from like literally not could play online video games and having to download movie in hours to fucking what we have today. Would you say like Bitcoin will always have those scalability issue over the decades to come and we'll always have to well, find a solution above like sediment or other federated system? I mean, there, it is not likely that we will get the average reasonably anonymous internet connection fast enough that the whole world's transactions can be on one chain. You know, it's just not going to happen. And I hate to say this, but frankly, Moore's law is dying. There's no getting around that. Mm -hmm. All of these things, we are heading very close to physical limits, and it's very unclear how you will exceed that. Um, and of course, remember, Moore's law specifically said that transistors would get cheaper, not necessarily that they would get faster. And it certainly is dead, like that scaling faster is becoming very dead. Transistor like clock speeds have not increased mm -hmm. significantly for years. And how many you can go put on a piece of silicon? Well, what's happening now is as you try to shrink them more, it just become more expensive. And maybe we'll find some clever way to stack the stuff, but like, who knows? And the way it's looking right now, all this stuff is slowing down. And to go from what Bitcoin is to all the world's transactions, you need so many orders of magnitude of scaling. It's not going to happen. Could we do it? Like, we have the layers, but we have also a side chain. So, what's your opinion on like liquid or like let's say sediment if we consider it a side mm. chain and liquid uh, on Lightning or federation uh, system like that? Would you just well, like offset federated side, side chain schemes. Yeah, they're fine. Um, Obviously, of course, in the case of liquid, it hasn't really caught on that much, but some I people know. go use it. Um, Fediment, maybe, I, maybe some people go use the stuff. You know, it's a totally valid alternative. Obviously, it has trust issues, but I think something you didn't mention was the merge mine side chains, okay. which I will say are extremely dangerous because they're ultimately just block size increase. So could you explain maybe to the viewer and even to myself exactly what you mean by that? Or how they would well, work? remember, the, why we want the block size small in Bitcoin one of the key reasons is so that anyone can set up a mining operation. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not as close to that as we want. In practice, set up a pool is a reasonably involved task. You've got to get a certain threshold to get enough uh, people so that your variance goes down. Um, there's potentially ways to get around this with you know, P2 pool type techniques, but regardless of all that, we certainly don't want to make this a lot harder. And the problem with merge mine sidechains is all they ever boil down to is trust miners. Which is the worst of the world. Yeah. Like what it comes down to is that miners can go steal whatever's on the, on the merge mine sidechain. You know, as long as nodes are not validating the sidechain, miners can go steal it. Now, I will point out, zero knowledge proofs could go fix some of this stuff. There are potential, I mean, it's not like this will always be set in stone, but with currently available technology, that is the property they have. They're trusting miners. And if you're trusting miners, you create incentives for centralization. And to the extent that things like, you know, Paul Stork's scheme of, well, you know, users will just do user activated soft fork if the miners do something bad. It's like, dude, did you see how much of a political mess that was? Why do we want to add more nonsense politics to Bitcoin for a tiny percentage of users. It's, 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 you know, it's madness. Much better to have systems that do not involve trusting third parties, or at least if they are involved trusted third parties, the people who choose to use them are the ones who have to do the trusting. Yeah. 
Liquid is fine. If you choose to trust Liquid, you can choose to trust Liquid. I have a bit of money on a Liquid wallet, so frankly, a professional interest, just to you know, yeah, be able to yeah. play with it. But it's fine if you want to choose to use it. Just leave me out of it. And so speaking of miners, there were, so we talked earlier about Wizard Sardin, and so one of the dev is uh, Kevin. And he, he was giving a talk at uh, Surfing Bitcoin, one of the conferences, mm -hmm. thinking about the, the straight model that Bitcoin could face and which one for him was the most likely. And he was like, well, China is going to invite Hong Kong and suddenly a bomb land right next to the manufacturer who created uh, the mining equipment. And then uh, at the same time, sadly, the US decide to take all the equipment from Riot. And so he was trying to like move to the extreme of yeah. what could be a state level well, ASIC attack. manufacturing is relatively centralized. Yeah, absolutely. Like, what would happen if I, that is the I, I, I hate to say it, but we are at the point where creating advanced chips of any kind, not just like Bitcoin ASICs, but you know the CPUs that go into your computers, the entire world economy seems unable to support more than a handful of companies doing this. That's crazy. Like, the, the sheer amount of money that flows into these chip fabs to make them profitable and make them possible to go and run, you need such insane economies of scale. I mean, I've heard estimates that it's t tens of billions, maybe low hundreds of billions, to set up a new, um, yeah, well, I mean, not so much a new fab, but like a new generation of fabs. And yes, they'll, they'll set up more than one, but like the people in control of this are fairly small. And of course, this is a problem for Bitcoin ASICs. But it's also a problem for the computers themselves that we use for all this stuff, Red right? Pie and yeah, the only reason we have access to any of this stuff is because computing is still something where you can buy a computer, you can install your software on it. That can be taken away. It can be taken away quite easily. And I would, I would tell people in the Bitcoin community, worry about the first thing. Don't worry about the theoretical stuff about you know, Bitcoin, ASIC production, because the way the geopolitics plays out there is probably not so worried. Worry about the fact that it's much, you know, it's not easy to go and install the software you want on like an iPhone, because that's coming down the pipeline for all computers. Mm. You know, Microsoft right now is trying hard to get desktop PC manufacturers to lock down the bootloaders so that only Microsoft OSs will run. And fortunately, they've had pushback on this, but I hate to say this, but the only solution to this, because of the scales involved, is going to be government action both to go and tell governments not to go do yeah. something like this, <laughs> as like, well yeah, as... That's not a good solution. Well, you know, uh, you know I mean... If the solution like, is to ask the government look, to be, hey, please look, be nice with us and don't stop the hardware. Look, the U.S. government has the capability to nuke the planet. Yeah, that's true. And right? Them not to right? The, oh, yeah, you have to ask them not to go do yeah. it. Yeah, and we pay could, taxes so they don't do it. Yeah, like, like it or not, there's a lot of things where the solution is to go petition governments to not go screw you over. There's a lot of things they can do, and you just have to accept that politics. And I think a lot of extremist libertarian Bitcoiners are just being idiots with this because they do not understand that the world does not work quite the way they want it to. You know, libertarianism works nicely in a whole lot of ways, but the world is not that. And if you want to keep the world reasonably free, you're going to have to play politics. It's funny, so I have a hat saying open source everything, but it doesn't really matter if we cannot run the software yeah. on the hardware that we use. That's absolutely true. And you know, us being able to have mobile wallets, right now it depends on, for the most part, Google and Apple playing nice. And Apple looks like it might play nice. Well, why? Because the European Union forced them to. The EU has said, hey, you have to allow sideloading. And sure enough, in the next iteration of iOS, apparently they're going to allow sideloading. Right? That was a success for politics. People went and petitioned the European Union and said, hey, this has to happen. And they said, well, you know what, Apple, you just have to do this. And Apple seems to have responded. Like it or not, we need to do that in a lot of more countries than just the European Union. Funny, so you, Peter Todd, you're telling me that we should go talk to the government and say right. an alternative to Apple Play and Well, it's not, it's not so much an alternative. It's frankly, at the economies of scale involved, you just have to say that, hey, these things just have to be this way. I mean, we, we need laws to go say that when desktop computers are shipped, the bootloaders are unlocked and you can go and install an OS on them. Because I hate to say this, but just say, saying, well, we'll just go make our own does yeah, not fly. I'm saying like, yeah, it's we not going to work. We can teach the kids how to uh, bypass that, but then you can tell me you can because it's the hardware. Yeah. Also, like this idea, oh, we'll just, you know, 
teach. We'll just bypass the bootloaders. I mean, a lot of people that we'll just crack the iPhones. Yeah. yeah, that's all well and good, but it gets harder and harder every generation to go bypass these locked bootloaders. And in some cases, nobody's figured out how to. I mean, at least nobody's figured out how to without taking the hardware apart. And in some cases, nobody's figured out how to, period. I'm sorry, but doing stuff at the chip level is really challenging. And it's absolutely technolo technologically possible to build a phone where you cannot install an OS on it that wasn't approved by the manufacturer. And we just have to make that unacceptable. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really, okay, it's, it's really funny how it's like out of the way, but also software, like for example, literally two days ago, three days ago, uh, Nostra got uh, cancelled from the Apple yep. Store, I think something like that, right? Yep. So we even show like the centralization yep. and the power of sensory, uh, the app itself. Yep. Whereas, because of the EU, it looks like pretty soon you will be able to install Nostra yourself, paying whatever you want to, because the EU has forced that. Now, we'll see if this really plays out the way we want to, but that's the direction it's looking to go, and you can thank government for that. Specifically, you can thank people petitioning government. Ah, it's funny. I have a stronger uh, bias against the EU. I'm from France, and I've seen the derive. Yeah of uh, their authority and their things on, on the, on the well, whole society. So. Look, just because you don't like what someone's doing doesn't mean you shouldn't go and necessarily work with them ever. I don't know, Especially no, when they have good. control over you. That's true. They also have the way to move to El Salvador. Where we well, are. that's nice, but remind me again, how many chip fabs does El Salvador I have? Really didn't say that. Yeah, I Sorry, it's not a solution. El Salvador is not self-sufficient with regard to tech. All of, all of this Bitcoin tech we have, it all depends on the outside world providing it to El Salvador. Yeah, El Salvador is very far away from having a, a mini chip factory. It, it's yeah. just too small. Yeah. El Salvador's population here is what, six million people? Yeah. I mean, you, you know, the, the, what it would take to build a chip fab is probably on the order of having six million people working well, directly or indirectly in that industry. It's just never going to happen. I mean, it's, it would be challenging for, you know, South America, given the size of their economies, to support one high-end chip fab. I mean, it's already challenging enough for the U.S., the richest, you know, per, you know yeah, basically the richest cu country in the world to do this. And you need all of Europe to combine to do, like, yeah. one thing. Uh, yeah. Especially, yeah. Um, the camera are overheating uh, because it's Salvador and it's so hot here. Yeah, it's, like, actually crazy. So uh, I had more questions, but... Too bad, maybe we'll do a follow-up at some point. Yeah. I had a question on like, which one was your favorite implementation for privacy on the low one? Wasabi, Samurai, Joint Market? Personally, uh, I use Wasabi. You use Wasabi? Yeah, Samurai is just sketchy as hell. No one should ever use it. Oh, damn. All right, the camera is getting too, too, yeah. too close, so let's just cut it here. Um, you don't have the image, but uh, we love you anyway. Peter, thank you so much. Thank and, you. Uh, maybe we'll do a follow-up at some point. Sounds it was good. quite interesting. See you.